the final exam. Um, so I'm kind of finalizing things for that right now. I wanted to give you some information about it before the weekend. Um, so the, 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 uh, our final exam format, I'm gonna have three sections. Okay, so there's gonna be a true and false section. Instead of multiple choice, we're gonna try this. Um, so I'll have a statement. You have to decide whether it's true or false. If it's true, you should cite a theorem or definition or fact that demonstrates why that statement is true. And if it's false, you should provide some kind of counterexample or explain why it's false. Um, there'll be 25 of these questions. From that section, the maximum number of points you can earn is 10. So in, basically, you need to end up trying to get 10 points out of 25 questions. Okay. Uh, part two are going to be like regular questions that would feel like a normal homework question or like an occasional test question. Um, so they're not multiple part. They're going to vary from one point to four points, depending on the level of difficulty. Um, there's 41 points worth of those problems. You need to earn 15 for full, like the maximum number of points you can earn out of that section is 15. And then there's uh, some free response question, multiple part questions, like the free response questions I give you, um, where one part often depends on an answer from a previous part. So there's 48 points available from those questions. Again, the, each part varies from one to four points. 15 points is the maximum amount of points you can earn from that section. Your goal for 100% is to earn 40 total points, 10 points from the true and false, 15 from the regular, and 15 from the free response. You can do as many questions from each section as you want. I'm going to just keep, I'm just going to be counting points. You can go through and do whatever ones you want. Should you be able to finish this? There's no way that you would conceivably be able to finish this. But that's okay. I don't want you to finish it. I want you to pick out the things that you know and you feel good about and to do those as best as you can. And whatever time you have left, you can start working on the stuff you don't feel great about. And again, try to acquire as many points as you can from that stuff. Katie, you get, all three points. you get it all at the same time. You can go back and forth, go skip around. If it's time, that should make things quite a bit easier because you know exactly what you have in front of you. Uh, you know, if you did 25 of the true and false, again, the most points you could earn out of that is 10. So I probably wouldn't do much more than like, you know, 12 or 13 of these things. I mean, it, a couple of backups is probably fine, but I wouldn't try to do like all of them. You know what I'm saying? Like make sure you have enough time to do questions in all the sections. But that's that's my format. So I think there's like, uh, let's see, 114 total points available. You need to collect 40 of them. Sound, you're okay with the format? I think, I think it should help being able to like kind of pick your way through that and like pick the stuff you feel good about and you can skip around some of the stuff you feel less good about. Chanel. For the estimate indicator for the statement is true or false, are you going to give like, for example, like a graph or something and say da 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 and then you have to say, oh, according to the mean value here, this is true? Uh, it would probably, they'll probably be written for the most part. So it be, could be something like, if f is continuous, then it's differentiable. True or false? False. That is false. What would your counterexample be? Like it could be a sharp corner. Great. So you draw a picture of a graph with a sharp corner. That would count as a counterexample. You're done. Moving on to the next one. Right? Does that feel OK? So in the normal tests, all your conceptual parts tend to fall into the multiple choice, right? Where it's I ask you to think about like, what does this kind of means? That's the true and false is kind of taking the place of those conceptual questions. Chanel. Um, so are you gonna have any like practice 
steps for us to practice like multiple choice or FRQs or like I would say that like the FRQ pieces, the things that we've done before I think are good practice. So the FRQs that we've done on the previous tests or that I've given you as practice before I think are still relevant. Um, you know, the homework problems that we've done in class, especially the ones that I've highlighted, I think are still relevant. Looking at the homework, like the regular questions from the previous tests I think are still very relevant. Um, the true and false piece, I, the way I would study this is I would go like chapter by chapter and identify like the major concepts and the major theorems and I would try to like have it in words, have it in picture, have it in a table like so I can think about what does this look like, you know. In the different forms. So, like, I depend if Mr. Kulik is like says, if f is defined by the table below, you know, is there some, you know, is the continuous function defined by the table below, is there some c in its domain such that f of c is 10? Sounds like the setup to an intermediate value theorem question. You know, you'd have to look at the table to see if there's two things one smaller than 10 and one less bigger than 10, and then you can apply the intermediate value theorem. So like that would be, could be a true question. You could say, oh, using the intermediate value theorem, you know, do we have this thing that's less than 10, this thing bigger than 10, so we have something in between there where f of c is 10, you know? So that that's what I would say in terms of, no, I'm not gonna give you like a study guide. Um, but I want you to like think about what we've done in like a like a connective kind of way, right? Like the point of a final exam is to help you like organize what we've learned like in your head. Like we're gonna really try to build the connections between these different concepts. And yes, you should practice specific skills, but really a lot of what you want to be doing is like rebuilding that conceptual foundation, especially from the early things that have faded a little bit, because that'll, I think, really kind of reinforce what we've seen recently. Um, but we can, we can talk more about like final exam preparations as we kind of continue through these last, would we have three or four more class days or whatever? Today, if we count today, there's four, right? Is that something? Um, and we're, we're okay with the format, though. This feels pretty fair. Yes. Okay. I, 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 again, like I know we've struggled here the last couple of tests finishing things. Um, I think having everything all at once will probably help that a little bit because it'll now be less tempting to like spend too much time on one half and not leave enough time for the second half, which I think a lot of us have been guilty of because um, it's hard to just like, Ugh, I have stuff I haven't done here yet and put it away when it's maybe you're like chasing your tail a little bit and you're just kind of burning time on stuff. Um, that's, that's maybe, you know, that's maybe my fault as well for a poor test construction plan, you know, Maybe it's just going to be like 45 or 40 and 40, and you just turn it in at 40 minutes in the future. And that might, I think, help ensure that like the stuff that you can do on the second half doesn't get just blanked because you just didn't have time to get to it. Um, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out a way to make that a little bit more fair, as I feel like I've done a poor job on that the last two times, the last two goes around. You know, and I can tell you guys are frustrated, and I don't want to do that to you. Um, when it's, you know, at least a big part of it is probably is probably at least as much me as it is you. Not that you're blameless in it at all, but like, you know, I don't want to use the phrase setting you up for failure, but it's like putting you in a position where it's harder to succeed than maybe it needs to be. 
Um, so that's that's my plan. Okay, we can talk more about this stuff kind of in the in the next, in the coming days, but I just wanted to put this out here so that as you guys are probably starting to pull things together, because this is well, one of your first four exams potentially. Uh, probably some of that is going to happen over the weekend, so I want to give you some idea of like what to expect. Okie dokes. Okay. Um, now, ideally, I'd like to um, talk about three more sections. We'll see if we actually do three more sections. But I do want to do one today. I do want to talk about these optimization problems here today. Yes. Um, did you say that this was as hard as 3.9? I feel like you said that at one point. Uh, well, it's, it's applied. So it's the same kind of like story problem situation. Okay. Uh, yes, Giselle. Uh, they would be things that would appear on the exam, yes. Um, and again, my exam is basically written. I need to proofread. I need to like do the problems and make sure everything turned out to like not be harder than I meant it to be. And then, you know, if something we don't end up actually getting to all of the topics that I had planned, maybe there has to be a question swap or two. Um, but as far as the, the representation goes, I would say that no sections are more represented than others. Um, it's, you know, it's not like it's going to be lots of four, five, you know, four, six, four, seven, you know, this stuff that we just did, it won't be, those things won't be featured any more prominently than things that we've done in the past. So, okay. All right. Um, so when we talk about optimization problems, what we mean is finding either the, like the best way to do something like the, or the, you know, like, let me think, let me fix it. Like finding the way to do, like to get the most out of something for the least, or to find a way to do something the fastest, or to make the most profit, or that it costs, the, uses the least resource. It's some kind of like finding a maximum or minimum for some kind of function. Um, so all of the tools that we used in like 4.1 and 4.2 and 4.3 where we found like the absolute maximums or absolute minimums or found the local maxes and the local minimums, all of those techniques are still going to be used in doing this. There is like one new conceptual idea here that's not much of a stretch. I'm sure that even without the statement that we write, you would have made this assumption anyways. Um, but it's mostly just using the things that we've just been, just gotten done using in 4.1 and 4.2 and 4.3, okay? So our textbook gives a suggested framework for how to approach these optimization problems. So the first step is to understand the problem. That means we read the problem and then we reread the problem until we like really understand what's going on. So if you have to read it one time, two times, three times, that's not uncommon, right? It's really important that you understand clearly the situation because oftentimes it's going to be something that's taking place in like the physical reality. And you're going to have things happening for like real world reasons. Um, Oftentimes there'll be a geometry component to it because you're trying to find like the cheapest way to make this figure or find like arrange this so you can hold the most stuff, something like that. Um, while you're reading, you should ask yourself, what are the unknowns? Like what are the variables? What are the things that are changing? Um, and what are the givens? Um, so what measurements do I know or what quantities am I given? And then, like, what are the conditions? Like, you know, can this thing be negative? Could it be positive? Like, 
am I allowed to go backwards or must I, you know, must I be moving forwards or something like this? You know what I'm saying? Step two would be to draw a diagram. Most of these things that exist in real world situations have a geometrical component to them or at least are best visualized. Um, so drawing a picture of what's going on on a sheet of paper and labeling the components, the parts you know or are, or are variables will often be quite helpful to you. Um, while you're doing that, you'd want to introduce notation. So the quantity that you want to maximize, they're using the letter Q there, but you're going to want to write a function for that quantity involving the knowns and unknowns that you're given in the question. Now, if your function that you've written is in more than one variable, you'll have to do some kind of elimination of variables procedure to get it down into a single variable, just like we did for the related rates problems, right? If you have a cone where volume and height is changing, the first thing we did was kind of make a similar triangle argument to eliminate either the radius or the height so that it was into one variable. Same idea here. Um, blah, 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 blah. So that was like three, four, and five I just talked about. Um, oh, one important thing, once you've written our, once we've written our function, we do need to think about its domain, right? Why would that be important? Two good reasons. One, if the domain is closed versus open, the procedure for finding the maximum or minimum is different. Second, if I'm searching for critical values, which I'm going to do regardless of which procedure I'm doing, I need to compare the domain of f to the domain of f prime to look for other possible critical values other than just where the derivative is zero, right? Critical values could also occur where the derivative is undefined. So the domain of f will be important to me because I'm going to need to compare the domain of f prime to that. Is everybody okay with kind of talking through the procedure? It's going to very much feel like the setup, like a related rates problem, and the finish, like a four, one, four, two, four, three problem. Okay? All right. So let's do some examples. So this says that a farmer has 2,400 feet of fencing and wants to fence off a rectangular field that borders a straight river. He needs no fence along the river. What are the dimensions of the field that has the largest area? So what are we doing here? Like we have some river and we're building some fence around it, right? So make some rectangle. And there's lots of ways we could build that, like we could build something that looks like a rectangle, or we could build something like that's tall and skinny, or something that's like short and really long. There's lots of different dimensions we could choose. We want the one that contains the most area, right? So everybody kind of understand what we're doing? Okay. So I'm going to introduce some notation now. So if I'm concerned about the area of this figure, I'm gonna need some dimension. I need to define its dimensions. So I know that I'm gonna call the one side length and the other side width. And this stuff contained inside of the rectangle, I'll call it A. So let's write an equation for area in terms of our picture. What would we write? So we'd say area, which is now a function of L and W, because both of those are unknown, equals L times W. Now we have a problem here, because this is in two variables. We need it to become a function in one variable. So what other piece of given information have we not used yet? Not the river. The amount of fencing we have, yeah. What is that going to give us? A number. The perimeter, yes. So we know the perimeter in our case is going to be L. 
plus W plus L, or that 2400 should equal 2L plus W. I'm going to use that equation for perimeter to reduce or eliminate either the L or the W for my area function. Which one do you think Mr. Kulik's going to choose to isolate, the L or the W? The W. Why did I pick? Why would I pick the W? Yeah, I don't have to do any division, right? Who on fractions? So by doing that, I can now write my area in terms of a single variable, L. So far, so good. Now let's think about the domain for L, or, for, or domain for this function, area function. What is the minimum value for L that I can have? Zero, right? Can it actually equal zero, though? No. Yeah, so we'll use an open, this will be an open interval. What's the biggest value L could have? No, 24. Not 24. 1,200. Yeah. Because there's two L's, right? Oh. Right? And again, can't actually equal 1,200 because we still need to make a rectangle. So we need to have a little left over for W, but it can be like as close as you want to 1,200. So this is an open interval. Is everybody okay with that? So I'm going to have to use my local minimum and local maximum procedures for figuring this problem out. Is everybody okay with that? Because it's an open interval rather than closed. Now, how did I make this decision that it was open? It was based on the context of the problem. It was for real world reasons, not mathematical reasons, right? Because I can't make a rectangle with a zero side length. I knew that it was going to be an open interval. So far, so good. Okay. We have a function that, in this case, we need to maximize because we're looking for the largest area. So now let's take the derivative because we have it into a single variable. Everybody's good with that? What do I want to do to take the derivative of A? Oh boy, you're making life harder than it needs to be. You're too harder than it needs to be. Harder than it needs to be. Distribute. Let's distribute that L through. Why is that a good idea? Now it's just a polynomial, right? Like it's the easiest possible derivative we can take. Do a little algebra. Don't do a chain rule and a product rule and like a whole bunch of stuff you don't need to. I saw so many unnecessary quotient rules as I was grading the test. It's like, oh my goodness. The, the denominator is a constant. Yeah, I saw many of them. All right. So now if I take the derivative, what do I get? Well, that's an L, L but sorry. that's... <laughs> I always draw the L's cursive so it doesn't look like a 1 on my paper, but I get that it looks like an E also because my penmanship is less than hey, spectacular. I was looking at my paper, though, so it's my fault. Okay, well then, I'll, I appreciate you taking the blame for that one. <laughs> All right, next thing we need to do is look at the domain for the derivative because we want to catch any critical values that might have occurred from taking the derivative. Now, what was my original function. What kind of function was that? Polynomial. polynomial. And the derivative is polynomial. So should there be any change in the domain? No. No. So it should be the same domain, right? Maybe we'll say we'll do that. So no critical values are created where the derivative is undefined. It says L is a member of the set from 0 to 1,200. So that's just like a curvy E is basically that symbol. It just means it's a member of the set. OK. So how do I find the rest of my critical values then? 
set the derivative equal to zero. Okay, what do I get when I solve that? That's something realistically we should be able to do in our head. You can. There it was, somebody said it. 624 divided by four, and then tack two extra zeros on at the end, right? Well within your capabilities. Uh, is that a maximum or minimum? Or maybe neither? We don't know. What do we want to do? We have to check it either using the first derivative test or the second derivative test. Now, since I have just one value to check, I think this makes more sense to do a second derivative test, in particular with how easy that second derivative is going to be to find. I'd, I think I'd rather do that than a first derivative test drawing the sign diagram, but you could do that too. Does it matter? Like, are there any criteria? It, in this case, it would not matter. In what case, would it? Um, Maybe in the case where um, the second derivative was hard to find, right? If it was going to be a difficult derivative, I would probably prefer the first derivative test. If it's a situation where I have to do like, if I have like 10 critical values to check, I might prefer the second derivative test just because it's like, I can just like plug, 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 and just go, 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 go. Like the calculator can do all the plugging for me. It just kind of depends, right? Here, I don't think there's any real preference other than when I do the second derivative, what's that second derivative going to be? Negative 4. That's always negative, so we know this is a local maximum, right? Because it's negative, or the critical value, or the second derivative is negative for all x, not just x equals 600, although that's the x we specifically care about. Okay. So, what does that mean? Because right now we know this is a local maximum. How do we know it's the absolute maximum? So, if the function is concave down everywhere, and we have a maximum at 600. Can there be any point higher than that? No. So if I have just a single critical value, and the graph is either concave up or concave down everywhere else, that's enough for me to decide that that thing has to be also an absolute maximum or minimum, respectively. Feel good? So the dimensions, we know L is 600. What is W then going to have to be? 12. 100. Thank you. And if we wanted to, we could calculate the area from that, but like, it was 72,000 or something? Seven, two with four zeros, right? Yeah. And what are these, are feet? I guess we should put some units on some stuff. Does that feel okay with what we did there? Not so bad. What's up? There's a lot of whispering going on. Uh, so if the second derivative, where the second derivative is negative, that's what's telling me it's concave down. Now the second derivative is negative four for all x. So I know a is concave concave down everywhere. So it's just going to be like a downward facing parabola. Does that? Would, Yes, that's the second derivative test, is if you have a critical value and the second derivative is negative at that specific x. So because I know the second derivative of is negative 4, 
the second derivative of 600 is still negative 4, right? And that's what's giving me the, it's a local maximum. Is that, okay. All right. You ready to move to the next one here, folks? Do another example. We're doing pretty good. You guys are helping out a lot. I appreciate the efforts. Here it says a cylindrical can is made to hold one liter of oil. Find the dimensions that will minimize the cost of the metal to manufacture the can. So what are we trying to minimize if we're trying to minimize the metal to manufacture the can? The surface area. Great. Who remembers the formula to find the surface area of a cylinder? You're going to need two pi r squared, top, bottom, right? And then you're going to need the stuff for the sides. If I take my can and remove the top and bottom, and I cut a straight line, and I unfold it, what I have is a rectangle, right? The height of that rectangle is going to be the height of the can. What's going to be the width of that rectangle? The perimeter of our circle, 2 pi r. Christian knows his geometry. So this is what we're going to try to minimize. What is the problem here? Two variables. We have r and h. So we're going to need to figure out a way to eliminate one of those variables. What haven't we used yet? The volume is one liter. Now we have to be a little bit careful here because we're looking for the dimensions, right? Dimensions are measured in things like centimeters or feet or whatever. My volume is measured in liters. I would like to convert that liters into like cubic feet or centimeters or something. Chemistry students, what is one liter? Yeah, as cubic somethings. Oh, that's, that's correct. <laughs> now, would I expect you to remember that? No. If, if I wrote the question, I would just write it as a thousand cubic centimeters and not one liter. But that's what the book did. So I'm just, before it pops up four other times in the homework or something, let's just do it now together. Everybody's okay there? How do you find the volume of a cylinder? Pi r squared h. So I'm going to use this volume equation to either isolate the r or the h and then substitute it back into our surface area equation to eliminate that variable. Which do you suppose Mr. Kulik's going to choose? Let's isolate the h, because I don't want any part of a square root in here. It's just going to make life a hassle. So writing surface area as a function of r. We have this. This could be a little bit neater there. That looks like a C or something. OK, um, before we move on, let's do a, like a little bit of cleanup here.
So there's my function that I'm going to try to minimize. What will the domain of this function be? So zero can't possibly be in it, right? Because that would make the function undefined. What's the biggest the radius could possibly be? Because you can make that radius as big as you want. You just make the height littler and littler and littler, and it'll still keep the volume at one liter, right? You can get that radius as big as you want as long as that height can go as close to zero as you want. So this is unbounded. That's fine. Again, like as long as it was open, you're going to be okay. As long as you recognize that, that was open. Did you guys catch the argument there as to why that went to infinity rather than to a fixed value? And really the key there is that like the volume equation that's fixed is multiplicative, right? So it should be unbounded. Before, when we saw the perimeter equation was the one that's fixed, that's additive. That should be bounded, right? Is everybody okay with that? So in general, if there's addition or subtraction, it should be, you know, number to number. If it's multiplicative, it could be infinite. Okay. Let's do our derivative. What's the derivative of 2 pi r squared? Great. Then how do I do the derivative of 2,000 over r? You absolutely need to do the derivative of that. You definitely don't want to do a quotient rule. You could. Yes. Yeah, we'll just do 2,000 r to the negative 1. That's exactly what you want to do. Boy, that was a lot simpler than doing quotient rules. Saw so many unnecessary quotient rules. So many. It's just like, oh no, what are we doing? Okay. All right. Uh, what is the domain? going to be now? Should be the same still, right? The only place where the derivative is undefined is at zero. Everything else should be the same as the function f. Do you think we get a lot of times where we pick up a difference in domain? No. No, but guess what's going to happen? As soon as you stop checking, that's when they're going to start showing up. <laughs> Because that's how my luck is. I don't know about you guys. All right. Now that we have our first derivative, we're going to set that equal to zero. And then solve. I'm going to write it this way. How should I solve this equation for r? May make a suggestion? I'm going to multiply both sides by r squared to get rid of the fraction. I don't like fractions. I'd prefer not to deal with it if I don't have to. Some of the things you said weren't bad ideas, but boy, that looks a lot nicer, doesn't it? Anybody with questions on what to do from here? Add 2,000, divide by 4 pi, and then cube root, right? Now I'm going to reduce that fraction. So far so good. I need to decide whether this is a minimum or maximum now. What are the two ways that I could do that? 
first or second derivative test. The one I'm going to use is the, I'm going to do the second derivative because if I don't have a calculator, coming up with a number bigger and smaller than that might be a chore. Um, so, you know, I could probably do like 1 in 10,000 or something, but like, I'm just going to do a second derivative. It felt, feels easier. So what's that going to be? It's going to be 4 pi, and there'll be plus, well, I'll write it, I'll write it this way, minus, and then negative 2 times 2,000 r to the negative 3. Four pi greater than zero. This also greater than zero. Everybody agree since the r value has to be non negative? I should say positive, it can't be zero either, right? So I know that the second derivative is positive for all r. So what does that tell me? a local minimum and because we're concave up for all r this is a absolute minimum now remember the question asked for dimensions so this would be uh, something centimeters and then the height how am I going to get that yeah, I'm just going to go back and plug in here. Hi, uh, and then R squared centimeters. Okay. Um, the lone concept in this section says that if I have some value of x, we'll call that c, and we have some open interval, right? We have n. We have any interval. If before c were positive and then after c were negative, whether that interval is open or closed, that is a maximum value. It's an absolute maximum value, regardless of the interval being open or closed, because it's the only critical point. If you have more than one critical point, you cannot say this. Unless it's like, I guess, well, I should be careful there, right? If I had something like this, nope, that doesn't even count because we're equal to zero there. I can't say that. Never mind. Yeah, have to have just one critical point. Is that okay? That's all it's saying. And then similarly, we'd say the same thing for minimums, right? Except it's minus plus instead of plus minus. But it's just covering... What if I had a local minimum? Well, if it's the only local minimum, then it's the absolute minimum. Assuming that it's, you know, you have that property where we're increasing or decreasing everywhere before it and increasing everywhere after it. You know what I'm saying? Does that feel okay? All right. Um, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do this one. We have some time, right? You guys are asked way less questions about the final exam format than first or than second period did. You're better. Yeah, I love it. Uh, it says find the point on the parabola y squared equals 2x that is closest to the point 1, 4.
So let's start with a little bit of intuition. What is this going to look like? Said it's a parabola, right? So y equals plus or minus the square root of two x. So it's going to look kind of like that, right? So this parabola is opening up sideways. So I'm going to just take some point on there and call that point x, y. And then we have the point 1, 4, maybe up here. Since I know if I plug 1 in for x, I definitely y squared is, or y should be the square root of 2. So like that's way up there out of the way, right? And we're searching for the distance between these two. So we want that. What equation can I write to find that value d? The distance formula. So that's going to be the square root of x minus 1 squared plus y minus 4 squared. What's the problem here, though? I have two different variables. You got it. How am I going to eliminate a variable? So I'm going to use the equation to substitute either an x equals 1 half y squared or y equals plus or minus the square root of 2x. Which one should I choose? I want x equals 1 half y squared because we don't have to worry about the plus or minus and we don't have to worry about a square root. Boy, I don't know what the heck to do with a plus or minus when I'm doing the derivative. That sounds scary as heck. Give me the 1 half y squared. Sounds like a better deal. Everybody okay with the reasoning there? Now, this looks pretty stinky to take the derivative of, right? You guys agree? What if I just do this? Now, let's think for a moment on the ramifications of what we did this. If I'm minimizing d, that should also minimize, that x and y would also have to minimize d squared, would it not? Yes. So I don't even need to worry about d squared. I can just call this like my f of y and not even worry about like doing an implicit differentiation thing. Like, that'd be fine. So the, the x, or I should say the y that minimizes d will also be the y that minimizes d squared. Because if I find the smallest distance and I square all possible distance, the smallest one is still going to be, because the distance is non-negative, right? So it's d squared is still going to be, this, the y that does d is still going to do d squared. Christian. Oh, yes, thank you. Yep. I dropped an exponent there and there. Thank you. Appreciate you being on the ball there. It makes it so much easier to catch it now than later. Okay. Uh, what would the domain here be for y? Oh. 
Yeah. Because you just think about the picture here, right? Y could be anywhere. We have the left end, or the one end pointing down, one end pointing up. That's going to cover everything. Good. You guys ready to do the derivative? Okay. Again, if you had done this with the square root in there, it'll still work. It's just yuckier. Um, and you know what I might even do here? I would almost consider, I, I might for a minute consider foiling those out. I don't, I'm not going to, but you could foil that out if you didn't want to deal with the chain rules. I think these are easy chains, so I'm just content to do it. But do you guys know what I mean? Like if you foil those out, if you can do that quickly, it, may, it might be worth your while to do it, depending on how confident you are with your calculus versus your algebra. That to me is, feels like six and one half dozen of the other. I'm just going to do the calculus with the chain rules because they're, like I said, pretty easy chains. So doing okay? I think it's cleanup time because we're going to eventually have to solve this for zero, but I'm, uh, I'm going to want to clean that up a little bit. So let's see. I distribute the 2 in and the y in. It's going to be y cubed minus 2y plus 2y minus 8. So my derivative is just y cubed minus 8. Gonna set that equal to zero. And what do we get for y? Two. Now I need to check whether that's a local maximum or minimum, because again, it could be, or it could be like one of these neithers, right? Um, oh, goes without, I hopefully goes without saying that the domain there for the derivative is all real numbers also. I didn't mention it, but easy to see that it's another polynomial. And since, again, these are coordinates, you know, can go forever. Uh, here, I might do a first derivative test because that feels real easy because that first derivative is y cubed minus 8. And I can pick y's to be all real numbers. That feels pretty good to me. I'm just going to do like 1 and 3. One cubed minus 8 is negative. Three cubed minus 8 is positive. So I know this is a local minimum, but really because it's this is true everywhere, I can really say it's an absolute minimum because that's the only critical value. So the x, then, that goes with it, because it asks for the point, is 2. Christian. Yeah, I didn't plot. I didn't actually here. Let's do this and give you a, a good looking graph. So we have y squared equals 2x. And then we have the point 1, 4. Or, yeah, 1, 4. looks a bit better, right? Because it looks like it would be perpendicular to the tangent line there. That should be the fat closest one. Maybe feels a little bit better. My picture wasn't to scale or anything. I just kind of like, I just wanted to like sketch something. It's like, okay, I know what the equation should look like. I wasn't trying to be accurate, but maybe I should have been. 
Um, let's do, well, at least one more here. This is a good one. Look at the paragraph here. A man launches his boat from point to A on the bank of a straight river, three kilometers wide, and wants to re reach point B, eight kilometers downstream on the opposite bank as quickly as possible. He could row his boat directly across the river to point C and then run to point B, or he could row directly to point B or he could row to some point D between C and B and then run to B. If he can row six kilometers per hour and run eight kilometers per hour, where should he land to reach B as soon as possible? We can assume that the speed or the speed of the water is negligible compared to the man's rowing speed. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, You're okay. Uh, may I get a, a drink of water, please? Sure. Uh-huh. So let's start, this is definitely a picture. Like I, no way I'm doing this without that. So here's my river. I'm launching from point A and we're told that the river is three kilometers wide. Uh, we know that point A is directly across the river Oh, I'm sorry, uh, no, that was point uh, C was directly across the river, and point B was here eight kilometers downstream. And then we said we could do, they said the man could do this as one route. He could do this as one route. Or he could try to land somewhere in between and do like that. Is everybody okay with the picture that we've drawn here? Does that feel like it describes the situation accurately? So I think I'm gonna add in one more unknown, which is I need to know how far D is from C, right? And I'm gonna call that distance X. And that ought to do it. Hi, how are you? That's okay. Sure, thank you. Okay. Now, what quantity were we trying to um, trying to find here? And I guess it was uh, da, 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 as quickly as possible. So we're trying to minimize what quantity, though, if it's quickly as possible. If I say do it quick, how am I going to measure you? Time. Yeah. So it's going to time is what we're wanting to measure. What we're wanting to minimize. Now, how long what are we trying to measure or what are we trying to time? How long it takes to go a certain distance, right? Everybody agree with that? and we're told the rate in which we can go. So let's rephrase this question as to like something practical. You have 500 miles to drive in your car. How long does it take you to go to get 500 miles if you're going 50 miles an hour? Going 500 miles at 50 miles an hour, how long does it take? 10 hours, because you took the distance and divided it by the rate. Everybody's okay with that, like high level piece. 
So the way I'm going to think about this problem, the only piece that I really care about is this part. Since D can move, if X is zero, then D is just at, or is just at C, right? If X is zero, D, point D is just at point C. And if X is eight, D is just gonna be at point B. And if any, it's anywhere in between zero and eight, it'll be somewhere in the middle, right? Is everybody okay with that? So my time here is going to be the distance from AD and then my rowing rate plus the distance DB divided by my running rate. Does that feel okay to you? So I'm just kind of writing in words what I want my equation to look like before I start trying to write it symbolically, right? So I'm going to call this function t of x. How do I write the distance ad in terms of x? Let me give you a hint. Yup, so the square root of 3 squared plus x squared. And the rate in which we row is 6 kilometers per hour. Very good. And then what is the, what is this distance, db, going to be in terms of x? Preferably. 8 minus x. Very good. And the run rate, we're told, is 8. What is our domain going to be? Not all real numbers. 9 plus x squared. Nope, 3 squared is 9, 9 plus 9 is still a positive, that's fine. Oh, it has to be greater than less greater than 3. Remember, what is x? It's the distance from c to d, where d has to be in between c and b, right? So 0 is us just going straight to c and then running. 8 is us going straight to B with no running. And then D is landing somewhere in the middle. Or X not equal to 0 or 8 would be somewhere in the middle. But 0 and 8 are okay to be, correct? Yes. Note that because this is a closed interval, my method of finding the maximum or minimum, I should say the absolute maximum or minimum, changes. Slightly. Okay. Do you remember what the procedure is if it's a closed interval? I have to check the endpoints and the critical values, and whatever the biggest one is the maximum, whatever the lowest one is the minimum. But I have to remember to check the endpoints as well as the critical values. Okay. Uh, before I get to doing any of that, though, we need to take the derivative. What do I need to do to do the derivative of the first piece? Square root of 9 plus x squared all over 6. Yeah, don't say a quotient rule. I'm going to be angry. Okay. So what is the derivative of the square root of 9 plus x squared? The derivative of the outside is 1 half. And I have the insides to the negative one half. And then the derivative of the inside is 
2x. Is everybody okay with how I did that derivative? How am I going to do the derivative for 8 minus x over 8? Don't say quotient rule. Let's think about it that way. Right? No! I'm going to throw something at you next time. i got to keep something here that's throwable that doesn't, doesn't hurt. There it is. <laughs> Missed. <laughs> Sorry, Christian. Good reactions, though. Just grazed him. Okay. So far, so good, yes? I do a little bit of cleanup here, right? What can we clean up? I think that's it, unfortunately. Now, if you look at this, solving this by hand is going to stink, right? We can absolutely do it, although if this is a problem where I have my calculator, I'm just graphing and finding the intersection. Let's be clear, right? That would be my preferred method. I'm going to go solve it algebraically now to show you, like, it's still doable and well within your capabilities, but, like, yuck is basically what I look at when I see this. Do you guys know what I mean when I say graph and find the intersection? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to double check. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the 1 8 on the other side. And then I'm going to multiply both sides by, no, 6 times 8 times square root of x plus or I'm sorry, square root of 9 plus x squared. Why am I doing that? It clears all the fractions out. Oh my goodness, I put that on the wrong side. What do you guys think? What we do from here? Square both sides, gotta get rid of the square root, right? Guess I could have divided both sides by two first, but whatever. Uh, let's divide both sides by 4. 81 plus 9x squared equals 16x squared. So x should be plus or minus square root of 81 over 7. But what's x? A distance, right? It's a distance, so it has to be positive. Most of you probably would have dropped a plus or minus anyways, let's be clear, or let, well, let's be honest with ourselves, right? But it should come up, but we're going to discard it because it's a distance. So that's my thing. The last thing I need to do now is to check whether this is a maximum or minimum or maybe neither. So there's three values to check.
Now, I'm not going to do this by hand. I'm going to do that part on the calculator. Like, let's be clear. Like, Mr. Kulik is not about, not about that life because woof, trying to figure out what that is doesn't look like a lot of fun. So which one is the one that we care about? No. We want the minimum time. Yeah, we want this guy. So our answer should be we land our canoe or whatever, our boat, square root of 81 over 7 feet or uh, kilometers from A or downstream of A. Something like that is the way you'd answer this. Is that okay with you guys? Now, how many of you guys have dogs? You ever take your dog to the beach and play fetch? You're standing like, you know, like the water's here, you're standing here, and like you throw something into the water over here. What does your dog do to get that? It does something like that, right? Have you ever seen your dog do this? No. Have you ever seen your dog do that? No. Somehow your dog knows, without really thinking, like the optimal way to get there. Somehow your dog already knows that, like, I don't want to do straight there. I don't want to go run all the way down and jump in. Like, it knows to go, like, somewhere in the middle and do that. It's odd, but, like, animals, like wild animals, have a really great heuristic for finding like these kind of optimal solutions to these problems, which is really weird to think about like how the heck they're doing it, but they do it. And maybe they don't find the absolute optimal, but they're it's really good. Is that is that weird to think about? Um, another instance, another instance. So like, say there's like a garden with like a bunch of flowers in it or whatever. And there's a bee that's visiting these flowers. If you watch the order that the bee travels to catch those flowers or to visit those flowers, it's almost it's almost going to be exactly the shortest path to do it. The bee does a really great job of like minimizing the flight distances. Does it without thinking about it. It's like an invertebrate animal. It doesn't have a real great brain, but somehow it's got a really great built-in heuristic for like finding the optimal way to do this job. Animals are good at this somehow, like better than people are, even with like a much less sick developed brain, but somehow can do this really difficult math problem without thinking about it. They have like a really good, when I say heuristic, do you know what that means? It's like a method to get an, an approximate solution, like a pretty good one, which is really weird, right? Like you can learn a lot of mathematics from watching animals. Sounds like a great like biology mathematics project, right? How many of you guys are HL people that are like, I need a new project? You could do it on something like this. So glad I'm not doing that. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but that's really interesting. I love stuff like that. That's like wild when you see like your dog doing calculus somehow. You see that pile that I just holding? Mm -hmm. That's like gum up like a leaf, like literally. Pretty gross. Really Pretty gross. Um, okay, so this feels like a good stopping point. Here's some problems. They'll be the last part of the last problem set you guys will do for the semester. Yes. Um, and we'll uh, have a great weekend, and we'll see you guys. You know, see you guys next week for the last week of classes this semester. I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry.